Well, as you know, we've been studying um, the Lord's Prayer. Something that is, you know, we pray every week. And hopefully I've challenged you to um, pray this on a daily basis and to take each phrase, little phrase, and to think about it, meditate on it, study it. Um, how can you enact it? And think about what does it mean when we pray this prayer? And um, today we come to the little phrase, um, and I'm, let's just read the prayer. Our Father in heaven, this is from Matthew 6, um, beginning with verse 9. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then Jesus goes on. The only part he adds a little addendum to, to emphasize the importance of forgiveness. And he says this. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's a scary passage. It's a passage filled with hope, but it's, it's also a scary passage in it. This past week, we uh, remembered uh, 9-11. And, and as I was studying this passage, I was thinking what an interesting contrast. You would see uh, posts and things on Facebook, and it would say, never forget. And, and we never want to forget you know, what happened on 9-11. The world was changed, literally changed. And we never want to forget that. Yet in the midst of the unforgivable, there needs to be forgiveness. I thought it was just interesting. And, um, and then there's a contrast growing up. I remember praying when like in sporting events or different events. Uh, sometimes you just gather around and we would pray the Lord's Prayer. And most of you have probably been in a similar situations and we go and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and somebody else is saying and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And I used to think that since most of the people were praying that, that, you know, the way I learned it was wrong and, you know, why are Presbyterians, you know, in the minority and, um, you know, I used to, to wonder about that. And I was really glad when I saw some of the modern translations and it says debts instead of trespasses and, um, and both words are important. And thinking about uh, trespasses, you know, the, when you trespass, it means you go onto somebody else's property without their permission. And so you, you trespass on their land. And that made me think about when I was in college um, I used to work as a telephone installer during the summers and on Christmas break. And um, I worked all over the Canal Valley and a little bit beyond, and, and I went everywhere. And this was before you had cell phones, and this was before you had GPSs, and they would give you a paper map, and, um, and they would tell you to go to these places. And, of course, in West Virginia, you sometimes wind up going up these hollers. And so one day I, re I remember... Um, I was going up way up this hollow, and I really didn't know where I was going. I didn't know if I was going on the right way or not. We had to use the telephone poles. All there are numbers on telephone poles, and that would we had to follow those telephone poles to get to the right uh, place. And so I was following this uh, these telephone poles through the woods, and and um, the road kept getting narrower and narrower. Then I was on a, a, a rough dirt road. And I didn't know if I was right or not, but then I saw a, a sign and it said, no trespassing. Oh, great. Went a little bit further and it said, private property, keep out. Went a little bit further and it said, survivors will be shot. <laughs> I was really worried now. 
So finally I pulled up, there was a little bit of a clearing, and there was a mobile home up there. And I thought, well, this has to be the right place. So, so I got out of my unair-conditioned um, company van, and as I shut the door of the van, I saw this pack of dogs running towards me. I, grabbed, I had my tool belt on, and I grabbed my biggest screwdriver, and I thought, oh, no, I'm going to be eaten by a pack of dogs, and no one's going to find me. And so there I was, and these dogs came running up to me, and they almost licked me to death. I think they were just excited to see another human, to see a human um, with them. But anyway, that was one example of trespassing, going on another's property without permission. Now, clearly, Jesus is talking about more than just that in this presentation, in this teaching. He's talking about sin, and he equates um, our, our sin with, with debt, something that we owe other people. And um, for, he, he, um, he says, forgiving those who sin against us. And it's crucial in our relationship with God that we also forgive those who sin against us. Have you ever thought about that? Forgiveness is no joking matter. Jesus died on the cross so that we could experience forgiveness. And since God's kingdom is grounded on his gracious forgiveness, forgiven people must forgive others. And yet so often we, we mindlessly quote the Lord's Prayer and we pray without thinking what we're really saying. Jesus emphasized the importance of this petition and his teaching to his disciples by adding that extra phrase after the, the prayer. He says, for if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. Well, to me, this is one of the most hopeful and one of the most frightening passages of Scripture. The good news is if we forgive others, God is going to forgive us whether we deserve it or not. And that's the important thing to note about forgiveness. Forgiveness is not based on whether you deserve it or not. You know, so often in my own mind, I said, yeah, but they don't deserve it. They don't deserve my forgiveness. You're right, they don't. That's what forgiveness is all about. That's what grace is all about. That's what mercy is all about. Not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. But however, the the scary part of this passage is if we don't forgive others, God will not forgive us and we will get what we deserve, which is an eternity and hell eternally separated from God. That's what every one of us deserves. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us are sinners. What's the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian? A Christian has accepted Christ, the cross, as a provision for our sins. As we began this morning, we, we know that we can't live in this world very long without being hurt. All right? If I were to ask you how many of you have been hurt, my guess is every hand in the room would go up, including mine. We've all been wronged, haven't we? As a pastor, I can't begin to tell you over the years how many times I've heard people who have shared with me how they've been wounded and and mistreated and and victimized. And I've heard uh, stories of betrayal and, and heartbreak and, you know, and it. And it impacts you. It, it affects you. I've listened to people, people that I cared about share things that have happened in their lives that wounded me. You may have walked through the doors of this church today 
carrying the weight of a serious wrong that is done to you this past week, this past year, or maybe years ago, and you're still harboring it and the pain in your in your heart today. If that's your situation today, and it's been mine in the past, I want you to share that, I want you to know that what we're going to talk about today is hard. It's hard to hear. It involves spiritual surgery. And you know what? Surgery is never fun, is it? You go in and you may not be in a great deal of pain, but when you come out, you're going to be in, in pain. But then the healing begins afterwards. The good news is that God wants to remove that toxic um, uh, cancer from our hearts. And he wants to fill it with love and joy. But the surgery that has to take place is forgiveness. When we pray, we're told to pray like this. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Notice when we pray this, I think it's very interesting. We're not praying, forgive me my debts, although that's a part of it. But we're also praying for the forgiveness of others. For instance, just take example, as we do this in church, we're praying, uh, forgive us our debts as a congregation. We're a bunch of sinners here in need of forgiveness. And so we pray, forgive us our debts, God, as we in turn forgive one another. Those people that wronged us, rubbed us the wrong way. They hurt our feelings. Whether they meant to or not, we're praying and asking for forgiveness. We're affirming the reality of sin in our lives and in the lives of those around us. 1 John John 1, beginning with verse 8, says this. You need to memorize uh, this passage. It says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You know, if we claim, hey, I'm, I'm not a sinner. Some people think that once they become a, a Christian, that they don't, they don't sin anymore or they can achieve as they mature in the faith, that they can achieve a sinless life here on earth. That's not what the Bible tells us. In verse 9 um, I've shared this with you in the past, and I, I've shared that it's like a, um, a spiritual commode. We used to use this analogy in Campus Crusade. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. You just think about that. Uh, yeah, it's a gross analogy, but, but um, you know, when we sin, it, it's like the stuff we put in the commode. That's what God, the way he views sin. You know, our view of sin and God's view of sin are sometimes very different. It's a stench in the nostrils of, of God. But, but when we flush that commode, when we confess our sins, that stuff goes away, never to be seen again. And, and clean water comes in and replaces it. And that's a picture of what happens when we confess our sins as he, he forgives us our sin and purifies us from all unrighteousness. But then listen to verse 10. If we, pro, if we claim that we have not sinned, we make him, that is God, out to be a liar and the, his word has no place in our lives. So if we say we're not sinners, you know, we're good people. Yeah, we're we're good people. We're calling God a liar because he says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So what does all this mean? 
trespasses. Who do we know that has trespassed against us? Some of you probably don't have to think very long, very hard, and someone comes to mind. And Jesus is teaching here that the forgiver and the one who needs forgiveness are one and the same person. I'm a sinner and I'm also somebody who needs to forgive other sinners. And Jesus did more teaching on this. In Matthew 18, Jesus told a a wonderful parable and Peter was probably, you know, um, meditating on this Lord's Prayer that Jesus had taught him. And, and he was thinking about forgiveness and what does this mean for me in my life. And, and uh, so he comes to, to Jesus in Matthew eighteen twenty one. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Somebody was, you know, they weren't getting along with, with Peter. You know, there's, there was some conflict going on in Peter's life. And Peter said, you know, what's this forgiveness about? The rabbis would say you need to forgive somebody three times. That kind of seems like a lot. You know, once, twice, three strikes you're out. But um, Peter was saying, I'm going to be really generous here. I'm going to double the three times and I'm going to add one just for good measure. So Jesus... What do you think? Should I forgive seven times? Aren't you proud of me? going to pat me on the back, back, sad boy, Peter. No. Jesus said, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. And others say seven times seven, 70 times seven, or 490 times. The point that Jesus is trying to make here is you forgive people over and over and over and over and over again. And then he goes on to illustrate his point, as he often does. He tells a parable that, that Janet shared with, with us uh, earlier with the children. And he said, therefore, the kingdom of heaven, remember, the kingdom of heaven is God bringing heaven down to earth. Not us taking earth to heaven, but God bringing his kingdom here on earth. The kingdom of heaven is is near, it's here. One of the big teachings of Jesus. And therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. You know, his... his, uh, his financial guys gathered around, say, look, you know, we've got some debts here. We need some cash. We've got to uh, collect some of the debts, uh, accounts receivable that haven't been received. And so we need to go on, uh, collect some, some uh, accounts owed. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. You, this is a, an incredibly large number. You know, some would say $25 million. The point that Jesus is making here, this is an impossible sum for this man to pay. Just like it's impossible for us to earn or merit or work our way into heaven. But uh, a man who owed him 10,000 talents, and he was brought to him, Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. They'll never get enough to repay it all, but I'm going to get as much as I can. And oftentimes debt, prison in in the earlier times was often something, it was um, a, a place where debtors would go. Until they paid the amount. Of course, it's kind of ironic. If you send somebody to to prison, how are they going to find the money to pay the debt? But it was a way to get people to pay their debts. And the Bible is very clear. The the understanding of of going into debt and the the biblical culture uh, is very different from what we have today. I mean, we live in a nation where we have tremendous debt, don't we? Um, You know, I, I can remember first time hearing... Um, 
government on the news hearing about a trillion dollars in debt. And I think, oh my goodness, I've never heard that number used before like that. And, and now it just keeps going on and on. And, and we have college students with coming out of college with huge debt. And we, we hear about this. So debt is a problem. But in the Christian times, in the earlier times when Jesus was there, um, you were not to go into debt. It was not a good thing to go into debt because the borrower becomes a slave to the lender. Isn't that true? When you borrow money, when you borrow money to buy a a car, you become a slave to the bank. And you have to pay that money or they'll come and take your car away. Um, and, and so we live in a time when we have great debt. But during this time, uh, debt was, was not a good thing. And you'd be thrown into debt, into prison if you had debts to pay. That's what was going on here. Well, the servant fell on his knees before him. You can imagine, it's not my family, not my children, not everything I own. And the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. I don't know how, but I'm going to pay him back. I'll pay you back, I promise. The servant's master took pity on him. He had compassion on him. And what did he do? He didn't say, okay, now you go out and... And pay me, you know, we'll set up a, a, um, a regular time schedule and, and you pay me back. No. He went beyond what this, this guy was asking and he canceled this unbelievable amount of debt. And then he let him go. You would think that there wouldn't be a more grateful person on the face of the earth than this guy. But what did he do? But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. That's like ten dollars. You know, I loaned him money to buy a pizza. And and now he's saying, you know, I want to be paid back right now. And he grabbed him and he began to choke him. Pay back me what you owe, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and he begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. Interesting. The same words that that um, this guy that had the great debt um, uh, reduced or, or forgiven. Same thing. Be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off And he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the ten bucks back. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and they went off and told their master everything that had happened. And then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. I didn't have to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And in anger, does God ever get mad? Yeah, there's a time for righteous anger. Does God ever judge his people? Yeah, God judges his people. Sometimes there's going to come the wrath of God upon the world. Judgment is coming. We don't have to fear that as Christians because we've been cleansed. We've been washed by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. But he washed it white as snow. We're going to close with that. But anyway, in anger, the master turned over, turned him over to the jailer to be tortured. This is going to be worse. The punishment is now worse. He's going to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. And he could never repay that. And Jesus closes by saying this. 
This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Wow. That's pretty powerful. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors.